Welcome, everyone. We're going to now have a press conference about recent findings from NASA's Curiosity rover about modern and ancient Mars. And to introduce the speakers, we have Jim Green, Director of Planetary Science at NASA, based in the headquarters in Washington, DC. Well, thank you very much. Curiosity has been on Mars now uh, about two and a half years and has made an amazing array of the fabulous discoveries. It's really completely changed our thinking about early Mars. At a time when life started on Earth, Mars had significant water resources, had a significant atmosphere, and if Gale Crater is any indication, had perhaps many places on Mars that could have spawned life and it could have survived, a habitable region. These are exciting times in Mars science, and we're making great progress in modern Mars. And that's so essential to understand what the planet is like today, indeed, because NASA's new thrust, of course, is on a journey for human exploration of Mars. And it's so necessary for us to study the planet currently for, to be able to support that. We are, indeed, on the journey to Mars. Today, we have some incredibly exciting results. I can't wait to hear the discoveries. And so with that, I'd like to introduce John Grotzinger. John is the project scientist of Curiosity, uh, and uh, he's from Caltech in Pasadena. John, please introduce your team. Uh, today, we're going to be hearing results uh, from our mission colleagues, Chris Webster, Sushila Treya, and Roger Summons. And what we're going to be reporting on is something that we've been hard at work on for the better part of two years ever since we landed, analyzing the atmosphere of Mars and the, and the ancient rocks at Gale Crater. And, and what we'd like to share with you today that we now have uh, full confidence that there is methane occasionally present in the atmosphere of Mars and that there are organics preserved in ancient rocks on Mars in certain places. This is important. Uh, methane in the atmosphere and organics in ancient rocks are important because they are chemically reduced molecules. On terrestrial planets, they compete for destruction with other kinds of molecules that are more oxidizing. And their preservation and occurrence is, is a matter, a certain matter of luck, for which science must provide a search paradigm in order to better understand how these materials are produced and where they go. But most importantly, they can both be consistent with the former presence of life or the existing presence of life. So that we detect methane in the atmosphere on Mars is not an argument that we have found evidence of life on Mars, but it is one of the few hypotheses that we can propose that we must consider as we go forward in the future. And organics, large organic molecules present in ancient rocks on Mars is also not an argument that there was once life on ancient Mars, but it is the kind of material that you would look for if life ever originated on Mars. So organics of any time, any kind, even abiotic organics, abiotically produced organics are the kinds of things we need to look for if we are ever going to find evidence that microbes once existed on Mars. So this is really exciting news for us. We have publications that are coming out today in Science Magazine on the methane that Chris and Sushil will be discussing. And, and then later on, we have a paper that's been reviewed and is now in revision by Caroline Fresenet of the SAM team that talks about the organics and all the measurements that you'll see today that Roger Summons will discuss. These are hard won. Uh, it took a long time to understand where to drill rocks and where to go. And what many people didn't know is that even while we were undergoing the large, long trek from Yellowknife Bay to Mount Sharp, we were analyzing these samples continuously over and over and over again, running blanks and standards, going back to the material, analyzing it different ways. The important thing is, is that Curiosity is a laboratory, and we've been using it that way. And that's why it takes a long time to get to a conclusion like this. And we also had to then arrive at Mount Sharp and drill a rock there in order to make sure that we weren't finding exactly the same thing that we had seen before and we didn't. And that's the reason that we can now pronounce this to be a discovery. 
Okay, so let me turn it over now to Chris to begin the discussion of the methane results. Thank you, John. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're here today to report to the first in situ detection of methane on Mars in the Martian atmosphere, and we've done that in two distinct uh, regions or two regimes. At, first of all, at a low background level of about 0.7 parts per billion, and then at a transient higher level that's 10 times uh, the background values. The measurements were being published today in Science, as you've heard. They were made using the tunable laser spectrometer, which is one of the instruments that make up the SAM suite. And the uh, SAM PI is sitting here on the right edge in the blue shirt, Dr. Paul Mahaffey. The measurements that we're reporting span a 20-month period, and this builds upon our earlier published result where we announced a low upper limit of 1.3 parts per billion from the first eight months only. So if we go to uh, the first graphic oh, here, this is uh, how the measurement is made. The lasers, the, the, an infrared semiconductor laser, the light comes in from the right and it multipasses 81 times between two mirrors before it hits a detector. And so we have a very simple sequence here of, um, uh, to look for the methane. We do that because the infrared laser, as you scan it, it looks at three distinct lines that can only be methane. These are, a very, these are a fingerprint of methane in the infrared region, so we're very confident of our uh, uh, detection and observations. We've developed a sequence. It's the same sequence in every run. It's an empty cell sequence, full cell with Martian air, then an empty cell. And so we, we then take the difference of the full cell uh, minus the empty cell readings. So uh, we've developed that very simple uh, protocol there. So for the, for the um, and we also analyze the data with the same uh, web-based analysis tool when we get the spectra back on Earth. For the background levels of methane, we were fortunate to, to be part of the SAM suite because we took advantage of a, a, a capability for doing methane enrichment. So as the air, is, as the Martian atmosphere is slowly ingested, we pass it over a scrubber that scrubs out a lot of the CO2, which is the main component in the atmosphere. This effectively, it takes us longer to fill the cell, but it effectively enriches the methane content in that cell. That gives us a much better signal to noise or a better precision. So from two such runs, and by the way, that's a photograph of the TLS instrument at the bottom. It weighs about three kilograms. It's about this size uh, for those of you who would like to know. And these are the results that, we are, uh, that we've published today. And uh, you can see the two enrichment runs on the right. They, there are error bars on those if you look carefully. And the result from those two, we determined the background level to be 0.7 plus or minus 0.2. That's 95% confidence. This is an agreement with our earlier lower precision runs. And uh, however, though, those, those va the value we get is significantly lower than the model predictions for the, what the background level should be. So uh, things were, we were repeating to make these low measurements, as you can see from the left. And then last November, on Thanksgiving, around about the Thanksgiving holiday, we were completely surprised. We suddenly saw five and a half parts per billion methane. Um, it was an oh my gosh moment. So we repeated the measurement a week later. We saw seven parts per billion. And then a month later, and again, we saw seven parts per billion. And then uh, our PI, Paul Mahaffey, insisted we do it a fourth time. Three weeks later, we saw nine parts per billion. And the average of those four sequential measurements is the 7.2 plus minus two parts per billion that we're reporting for the high methane period. This period lasted two months, remember. <clears throat> Six weeks later, we looked again, and it had completely disappeared. We were back at background levels, as you can see with the first enrichment run. We repeated that three and a half months later, and this time we, we did a simultaneous regular run to validate uh, the two uh, different methods, and you see they agree very well. They're both actually recorded on the same day. So here we had witnessed an unexpected episodic increase in the Mars methane. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Sushil Atreya to tell us what all that means. 
I'll try, Chris. Thank you. Um, I have a number of comments to make, to, so I brought my cheat sheets. I hope you don't mind. Um, there are three really striking things about the data that uh, Chris just showed. Uh, a relatively low background on the order of uh, seven-tenths of a part per billion by volume. Uh, a sudden spike in methane that is ten times stronger than the background. And just as suddenly, uh, the disappearance of methane back down to the, uh, to the background level of seven-tenths of a part per billion. So what this is telling us is that Mars is currently active, that the surface or the subsurface is communicating with the atmosphere. And we can get a better feel for this by looking at this illustration. Chris, if I could have this slide. Um, and this, I, I'll just walk you through this. I'm showing possible sources and sinks of methane. I'm just going to focus on three most likely scenarios to explain the methane that we're seeing on Mars, both the background level as well as the spike. Uh, methane can be generated from the action of the solar ultraviolet radiation on surface organics. Cosmic dust in the form of interplanetary dust particles, uh, micrometeoritic particles, is a good source of surface organics. Uh, in the presence of liquid water, uh, methane can be generated by biology or geology. Uh, in the past, when Mars was wetter and warmer, uh, these kind of processes could have taken place. But even today, if there are subsurface aquifers present, the press process can occur uh, today as well. In geology, uh, rocks containing minerals of olivin or pyroxene, that's common, to, common on Mars, uh, would interact with water and produce methane in the process known as serpentinization. Uh, in biology, certain microbes known as methanogens produce methane in their metabolic process. So once methane is produced, it can be stored in the subsurface. The storage is in the form of clathrate hydrates of methane. These are molecular cages in which uh, it's a water, ice, lettuce structure in which methane gas is trapped. From time to time, the clathrates are destabilized, methane escapes, and finds its way through cracks and fissures in the rocks and gets up into the atmosphere. So whether methane was produced biologically or geologically or by the surface uh, organics, uh, once it's in the atmosphere, the winds are going to move it around. In a matter of a few months, methane is going to be distributed over the entire planet. In the atmosphere, uh, photochemistry destroys methane. Solar photons, solar UV photons are absorbed by methane. They pull apart the methane molecule. Both methane and the products interact with the chemicals in the Mars atmosphere. Methane and the products get oxidized, and they form <coughs> things like formaldehyde and methanol. Ultimately, they all go into carbon dioxide, and that is added back to the background carbon dioxide atmosphere. So the very low background level of methane that we are seeing could result just from the UV degradation of the surface organics. Uh, biology and geology could add to it, but they're not really required. The sudden spike in methane that we're seeing over a two-month period, that represents a burp of methane from either a modern source or leakage of methane from uh, clathrate storage. Uh, <clears throat> the fact that methane uh, was at the background level it suddenly went up, came back down to the background level as suddenly, uh, indicates that the source must be relatively well localized and small. And uh, looking at the wind fields in Gale Crater and around Gale Crater, we suspect that the source is northerly. So uh, all these observations that we have over a two-year period, they are strongly suggestive that Mars is currently active. With that, I'll pass it on to Roger Summons, who's going to tell us about ancient Mars. Roger. Thank you very much, Sushil. Um, my, my first uh, view graph uh, serves to illustrate why the search for organics on Mars is so important and why it's so interesting. Uh, here I've depicted five molecules that are widely distributed on the surface of the Earth. We can find them deep in the Earth. We can find them in meteorites. 
There's simple organic molecules, but there's nothing intrinsic about their structures that tell us whether they're biological or not. They can be made biologically, but they can also be made by water-rock interactions. They can be made by uh, photochemistry. Uh, compare those in the, with the molecules shown in the next uh, panel. Please, Chris, next one. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm out of sync, sorry. <laughs> so these molecules uh, are very different. Uh, they're typical of the things that are formed uh, by biology. And uh, we generally find them in complex patterns. Uh, and in particular, they have very often a three-dimensional aspect that can only uh, be imparted by biological activity. So whatever we find on Mars, it's going to tell us something about what formed the molecules and uh, what sort of processes were involved in their, pres in, in their preservation. Next slide, please. So this uh, view graph depicts uh, gas chromatographs or gas chromatograms that were actually generated on Mars by uh, Curiosity. And the first thing to appreciate here uh, is that uh, this represents a tremendous scientific and engineering accomplishment. It's not trivial to generate data like this in a laboratory, let alone on another planet. And what the graph shows are uh, a series of peaks. Uh, the first four on the left-hand side represent uh, molecules like methane, but where one of the hydrogens or two, three, or four, or four of the hydrogens have been replaced by chlorine. We've seen these molecules before. Uh, we're still debating their origin. They could be indigenous to Mars, but they could also be uh, carried to Mars with the wet chemistry experiment uh, that, that's on board SAM. So their, their origins are um, ambiguous. The next three molecules uh, have two, three, and four carbon atoms, and each of those have two chlorine atoms as well. And we've never seen these before on Mars in any of the other samples other than the Cumberland mudstone. And uh, peak number eight is chlorobenzene. We've also seen this before in other samples on Mars, but never in the abundance uh, that we found in the Cumberland mudstone. And you can see by comparing the upper trace and the lower trace significant differences in the concentration between th those compounds in Cumberland versus the same compounds in a blank. Next, please, Chris. Next, uh, this graph uh, shows the abundances of chlorobenzene now compared uh, across most of the samples that have been analyzed by SAM. The experimental conditions for all these analyses differed somewhat because the experiments were targeting different aspects of the sediment chemistry. But the thing that is uh, so obvious is that six of the samples from the Cumberland mudstone where the conditions, experimental conditions were uh, ideal for detecting chlorobenzene, you can see a marked increase in the abundance of chlorobenzene compared to all the other samples and way above uh, laboratory or the, the sample blanks. Next, please. Uh, this last view graph uh, illustrates why the search for organics on Mars has been so difficult. Uh, the surface of Mars is a very hostile environment for preservation of organics. First of all, we have constant bombardment by cosmic rays, which destroys organic molecules. The longer the exposure, the more the destruction. Mars surface uh, soils and, and sediments are strongly oxidizing. And so organic molecules are prone, all organic molecules are prone to oxidation. An example here is what we call Fenton's chemistry where uh, iron minerals, peroxide, and UV light combine to oxidize organic molecules up to carbon dioxide. Fenton's reaction, of course, is used on Earth widely to clean up uh, waste, organic waste sites, a very effective way of destroying organics. And lastly, we have uh, soils that contain perchlorate. Perchlorate is formed by sodium the interaction between sodium chloride and ozone. 
And when you heat perchlorate, it liberates oxygen, chlorine, and hydrochloric acid. Uh, the oxygen can destroy the organics, or the hydrochloric acid or chlorine can chlorinate uh, the organics. So the experimental protocol of heating soil samples uh, that contain perchlorate uh, is bound to either destroy them or to change them. Uh, there are ways around this. Uh, as you know, Curia or SAM ca carries a wet chemistry experiment, and the SAM team is com currently evaluating methods uh, to circumvent the, the, the perchlorate issue and hopefully detect even more and more complex organic molecules. And with that, I'll pass it back to John. Great. Uh, thanks, Roger. Okay, so let me try to wrap up and, and summarize a little bit. Uh, what, what you've heard about, and also, most importantly, what we're going to do in the future. Uh, Curiosity continues to be a mission of exploration, and we are now in the lower strata that define Mount Sharp. Uh, we've drilled one hole, and in the next couple of weeks, probably in the new year after the holidays, we're going to be drilling a second hole. And as that data comes back, it allows us to look at different combinations of, of past geologic processes that, that influence the distribution of organics, as, as Roger was talking about. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Regarding methane, we don't really know what the sources and sinks are. As Chris and Sushil explained, it just seems to appear. And so we don't know when it might appear again, but we will monitor continuously. And if it does pop up again, what we can do then is tighten up our sampling afterwards and study the dissipation of the signal in a way that we didn't get to do the first time around without knowing what the signal is. And in characterizing the signal then, we can test hypotheses for what might be the destruction pathway for the methane as it disappeared. So we plan to do that. Now, with organics, uh, let me take a, a little bit of a step back here. Uh, what you've heard today is us, after two years, basically declaring that, that we have had a major discovery, that we found organics on Mars. In part, Curiosity was built to explore for organics, and we found it. But we found it, in hindsight, with 2020 vision. We knew we were on to something. But it's hard to know for sure that it's not a false positive until you've analyzed more rocks. In other words, you don't want to get faked out. Maybe it was contamination from the instrument. And so it took us some time to work very carefully through that. But let me talk particularly about the discovery itself, because this is really a great moment for the mission. Based on orbiter data, after the landing site was chosen, the science team basically divided up the landing ellipse into small quadrangles and mapped them especially using Odyssey data and topography data and the texture data that comes from high rise Because this place where we drilled in Yellowknife did not have a chrism signature of mineralogy, so there was a big risk that we might not find anything in going there. There is serendipity in this kind of, of discovery. I don't think it was exactly luck, and on the other hand, uh, it's not like we really predicted that this was going to be a high chance of success. We drilled the John Klein drill hole that Roger showed had very little, if any, signal in it of organics. But then we moved over to Cumberland, and the hypothesis that we had in place at that time was that there was a much greater concentration of these concretionary features. And we don't know that that's what caused the concentration of organics that was discovered there, but that was the hypothesis we were testing. And now we're going to do that over and over and over again. And it might seem boring at times. Why is Curiosity not moving? Why is Curiosity finding the same thing over and over again in the pictures? But what's going on is that we're cooking things up in the laboratory. So let me just talk a little bit about that. Mars is turning the corner from a planet that used to be one where space missions would explore it in a very inductive mode, where you observe and seek to explain. It's what I like to call the Star Trek mode. Build a spacecraft, go out there, find cool things that nobody saw before. Mars is now becoming a proving ground for a much more deductive uh, uh, line of, of science. You heard about the MAVEN results yesterday. They're testing very specific hypotheses about how the atmosphere of Mars eroded. We're doing the same thing with Curiosity with these ancient rocks. And so as we dig in with our drill bit, we're going to be able to work through a matrix of possibilities that will deal with three factors. And to refer back to this slide, 
The one destruction factor that most people are very familiar with is cosmic radiation. It hits the surface of the planet. If there were organics in that rock, they will get destroyed. And so we have an image here of what you might call an organics table. You need to get two meters below it in order to find the good stuff. Well, with Curiosity, being able to date the surfaces uh, um, that we published on earlier this year, we can find these little cliffs, these little bedrock exposures, where maybe the rock is actually fresher there. So we don't have to worry so much about the cosmic radiation. But nevertheless, there have to be organics in that rock to begin with. It doesn't help to have a rock that doesn't have the organics in it to begin with. So here's how it works. You take loose sediment, stuff comes into it, either falling in from outer space as organic material, maybe there was a biosphere there, we can't rule that out right now, but it accumulates organic. So if you don't have initial accumulation, it doesn't matter how much it's getting bombarded by cosmic radiation, you gotta have that first thing go right. Then the next thing is, all that rock used to be sediment and you have to convert it to rock. This is a process that geologists call diagenesis, conversion of sediment to rock. And when you do that, fluids move through the rock. If those fluids happen to contain strongly oxidizing compounds like perchlorate, they can react with the organics and destroy it just in the process of becoming a rock. So this is, you, you should get the sense that this is getting harder and harder. And then the rock is up at the surface getting bombarded with cosmic radiation as anything is left in it that, that, that started off with it. So that's the way we're going to work it as we go forward in the future. And hopefully the legacy of the MSL mission will be to leave behind for the 2020 mission a blueprint for how to go about the deliberate search for a very subtle signal based on understanding all these processes. And we may never get lucky again. We may never find more organics. But based on this pattern, maybe we will, and we can get smarter at learning how to explore for those materials. I'll wrap it up with that. Thank you very much, speakers. And now I'll open the floor for questions. And please identify yourself and your affiliation. Yeah, Alex Witsey with Nature. For either John or, or Roger, can you just talk a little bit more about chlorobenzene in Cumberland and specifically help us understand the context why the levels were so high there as opposed to the other drill sites? I have no specific uh, answer to why Cumberland uh, contains that that particular compound in such a high abundance. But it, it's, it's one of four compounds that, that, that are clearly indigenous to Cumberland. So presumably Cumberland contains a significant amount more total organic carbon than, for example, the rock nest soil. The fact that it's chlorobenzene, uh, again, it's ambiguous about whether it's present in Cumberland as chlorobenzene or whether it's present in Cumberland as something uh, like benzoic acid. And we've been doing many analog experiments, uh, both at Goddard and at MIT, testing organic molecules for their, the, uh, what they produce when they're heated with perchlorate. And you can form chlorobenzene when, you've, when you heat any uh, aromatic compound that has a functional group. That is not benzene itself, but benzoic acid, phenol, compounds that have already have something attached to the benzene ring, when they react with perchlorate, they produce uh, chlorobenzene. The other uh, way we've produced chlorobenzene in significant amounts is heat samples of the Murchison meteorite in the presence of Mars analog materials containing perchlorate. So a little bit of meteorite, some olivine sand and some perchlorate, and you produce large amounts of chlorobenzene. So there are probably a number of precursors that can yield it, but it's in indicative of more complex organic carbon present in the sample, I think. Alex, let me just add a little bit more to that. Uh, so here I've put back up the graph of John Klein versus Cumberland. Those samples were collected roughly two meters apart from each other, and we don't know this. It's just a hypothesis, but the the, the science team, when faced with, the, we wanted to drill a second hole and then start the drive to Mount Sharp. And when we 
asked ourselves of all the various features that we see in the rock, what property might be something that would help preserve organic carbon if it was there, it was the notion of these early diagenetic concretions. So the sediment's there and there's a reaction that triggers this precipitation of the mineral, wh whatever it is that makes the concretion, maybe that might lock something in. So we don't know that that's the cause, but when we drilled it, in the paper that's in review right now, that's our explanation for what might, what, what, why there might have been a preferential enrichment of organics there and not in John Klein. Hi, uh, Ken Chang, New York Times. A uh, question about the methane. You had a high measurement last July. I was wondering why wasn't that an oh my gosh moment. Um, you had another measurement, I believe, a week later that where it dropped and it was compatible with the background, but it was also compatible with the high level. And isn't it possible that you could have had methane there at the enriched levels for six months. Okay, so uh, what, had, what happened was uh, we were making these measurements for the eight-month period, and that measurement you refer to as the first daytime measurement. And as we, as we got a little bit past that, uh, we, we completely reprocessed all our data because we recognized during that daytime measurement that there was a small drift to do with the laser temperature that needed to be corrected. When we, correct, when we made those, that correction to all the data set, it's essentially a, a filtering of one or two uh, points out of, uh, out of 52, um, it, that point moved upwards to the value that it is uh, seen today. The rest of the points, they remain at the low upper limit. Every, uh, the, the result from the science paper is intact. If you were to include that point, it would push it up somewhat, uh, for example. But you're right, that is, and, and as we saw that, it was definitely a, a head-scratching moment. But it's really when you see a sequence of one and two and three and four measurements in a row, uh, that, that really together make the oh my gosh uh, validation of the high methane. But in looking at that data set as a whole, there's no doubt that that measurement you refer to was really um, a, a teaser of things to come. Hi, I'm Dan Vergano with uh, National Geographic. Um, could you guys say, what, what are the odds you put on a bacterial origin for this, these methane spikes? Are they, all these alternatives equally likely? And also, what's the lifetime of a clathrate cage under the surface? How long could something like that be sitting there and just cook off? Thanks. I'll take the first part, maybe Sushil, you get the second one. Um, the, uh, you know, the probability of any of these things being sources, there's no way to quantify that. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to answer that question. I don't think anybody in this room could. Uh, we just have to respect that it is a possibility, and, and it's our responsibility to basically go through and falsify all the other abiologic hypotheses to result in one that is. But what we feel that this data is most valuable for is for encouraging the future that because we are seeing signals here, it's worth coming back and doing more work. Yeah, with regard to the lifetime of the clathrates, it depends on where they are uh, stored, whether they are just beneath the surface uh, the clathrates can get formed in ice, and they could be several meters below the surface, but then they can float up to a shallower level, and when they're in the shallower levels of the, of the subsurface, their lifetime is relatively short. They can be destabilized by mechanical stresses, by thermal stresses, or even if there are small impacts, uh, they can uh, destabilize the clathrates. If they're buried deep, then they'll last a long time, which is a good thing, because if Mars had methane forming in the past and that got buried deep in the uh, clathrates, then it could be ancient methane, but then the clathrates are going to float up gradually and they'll come to shallower subsurface where they can be. Oh, we're talking billions of years. You can store them for billions of years. There's no problem. But once you get them up into the subsurface, uh, just beneath the surface, then they don't have to last, last very long. They can destabilize quite easily. Emily Lochtewalla from the Planetary Society. I've got one question about ancient carbon and one about the modern methane. 
The ancient one is, um, I'm wondering, looking ahead at the future rock types you're going to visit, do you have any reason to believe that any one of them is more likely than any other to contain the kind of stuff that you saw at Cumberland? And then the modern question is, have you tried to figure out, in terms of the amount of methane that you're talking about, how big an event, how big a geologic event would be necessary to release this puff of methane? <clears throat> is it a tiny event or a large amount of magma moving beneath the subsurface or something? Can you give a sense of scale? Uh, yeah, Emily, I'll take the first part and you guys can go for the second. Um, yeah, so that's uh, what we're hoping to do is, uh, uh, Dave Blake is the PI for the chemin instrument. He's here to chat with afterwards as well. But basically what we see now in the first hole that we've drilled at, at, uh, at, at Confidence Hills is um, we see a rock uh, that ha mineralogically has uh, not just magnetite in it, but also hematite in it. Uh, we reported on that already. It also has clay minerals in it, and it looks like it's going to have sulfates in it as well. And so we're starting to see a, a more complex mixture than what we had in the past. And, and maybe hematite is not a good thing, and maybe the sulfate minerals are not a good thing. What we know we had back at Cumberland and John Klein was a rock that represented a low salinity environment, relatively fresh water, moderate pH, and, um, and it was one that, that formed clays. And so now we've got a mixture of things. And what we're wondering is, is that as we drive along, can we learn to recognize rocks that, in which the mineralogic proportion of these materials might change? And so far, we don't, we don't have a good recipe for that. We, it's not obvious how we're going to anticipate that other than just drilling more holes. So what you're going to see us doing now is doing a whole lot more drilling than we did in the past, just trying to characterize the distribution of the chemicals and minerals that make up the rock. So as far as the amount of methane, if you look at, uh, to get a scale for it, the, the 0.7 parts per billion is about 5,000 metric tons of methane in the atmosphere of Mars. <clears throat> and that has to be compared on Earth. You have 500 million tons of methane uh, in the current atmosphere of Earth. So that's a, that's a beginning uh, answer to your question. Sushil, do you have any more comments? Uh, yeah, so uh, that number is the total amount of methane in the atmosphere, 5,000 tons of methane is what uh, the background level, and of course you can translate that into seven parts per billion, but the, the peak, uh, for the peak, the number is of course larger, but it also depends on where the source was. If the source is within Gale Crater, then you can pretty much scale it from 5,000 times almost 10. Uh, but if the source is further out, then the, uh, the amount is going to be uh, much greater. We don't think the source is too much further out from Gale Crater, but uh, you know, it's a possibility. OK, we'll have a couple of questions from the chat. I'm over here. Um, this is a question for the team, and you may have already answered this a little bit, but just to clarify, please. This question is from Camille Carlisle at Sky and Telescope. Uh, what are these concretionary features at Cumberland you mentioned might be related to the organics, and what do you need in order to prove or disprove the potential explanations? Uh, good question. So the concretionary features are uh, they're very common on Earth, and in some cases on Earth they are known to be uh, to preferentially preserve organic materials. Not always, but in some cases. They form very early on uh, in the diagenetic sequence and the transformation from loose sediment to rock. And they grow by minerals or maybe even amorphous materials that propagate through the pore space and the sediment outwards in all directions, and they leave a sphere behind of the material that, that precipitates there. And then after that, the rest of the rock, can, the rest of the sediment can be made into a hard rock, but, but by fluids that might be chemically more aggressive than those that made the concretions. So the way that, that we would do something like this, and we had this discussion as a team back in Yellowknife Bay, we could have spent a large chunk of the rest of the mission there and never gone to Mount Sharp. The way you would want to test the hypothesis is to drill a statistically significant number of holes where you drill into the concretions and off the concretions, and then into the concretions and off the concretions. Do it over and over again until you can show that statistically rocks that have concretions preferentially preserve organics. And, but this is Mars, it's not Earth, and so we, we wanted to move on to explore a greater range of materials to try to find out 
what the right recipe is for the preservation of organics. And let me, let me just take another 30 seconds to point something out that may not be obvious. This is hard to do. And we do want to pass on as our legacy that we've investigated a large diversity of materials. And the reason why is because in 1859, when Charles Darwin uh, published The Origin of Species, he listed a principal challenge to the hypothesis of evolution. And, and in that, he argued that the sudden appearance of trilobites was, was uh, not consistent with gradual evolution. And he predicted that someday somebody would find the antecedents to these trilobites. And so if you go to the part of the Earth record where microorganisms are the only life form on Earth, guess how long that took? It took 100 years. In 1959, Stanley Tyler and Elzo Barghorn published in Science on the Gunflint Chert. They found the magic mineral. It's a thing called chert. And on Earth, the vast majority of microfossils on Earth is preserved in this material called chert. We don't know if we have any of this on Mars, but we think maybe something like the Cumberland situation, maybe this is our gunflint chert moment on Mars. And we don't know that we're ever going to find anything again, but we're going to look for these kinds of things. And we do have a clay unit that's way up there on Mount Sharp. Another year or two or three, we're going to get to that thing, and, and we may come back into similar stuff. So stay tuned. Thank you. I have another question from the chat. This is a question from Irene Klotz of Discovery Channel News and Reuters. Uh, this is a question for Susha. Regarding your comment that a local uh, weaker source of methane is the preferred explanation for the spikes, uh, just curious if and how you eliminated possibility that spikes stem from a larger source farther away and wind shift triggered the dissipation? Uh, also, does a local or regional source of methane impact the thinking about whether the gas is biological or geochemical in origin? That's a really good question, and there are two parts to it. Um, <clears throat> with regard to uh, preference for the local source, uh, our thinking is that if the source was distant, it had to be much stronger than the seven parts per billion of the peak we are seeing here. Uh, and if the source is distant and stronger, then our background level should not be uh, this uniform seven tenths of a part per billion. We should be seeing this kind of a large background uh, because of the stronger source from the distance. And methane would not be going down as suddenly as it did after our fourth observation. So from on that basis, we prefer to have a localized source that is small. That's a, another important thing, the source should be small because methane disappeared quite quickly. And it doesn't have to do with the lifetime. The, the lifetime issue doesn't come into it because it's a sporadic episodic release and it disappeared and it, we may see it again. Uh, with regard to the uh, second question about the biological versus geological origin of methane, as John said, we're really not in a position to, from these data, to uh, say one way or the other what the origin is. Uh, if someday we find really huge amounts of methane, by which I mean tens of parts per billion, we will be in a position to make the measurements of the isotopes of methane, the carbon-13 to carbon-12 but we need much stronger signal uh, to do that. And as we move into the future, as John was saying, uh, we will be making uh, observations. And if we do come across large amounts of methane, we'll move one step closer to addressing that issue. Yeah, and, and of course, while the carbon-13 measurement is an indicator of potential biological activity as we see on Earth, they're difficult measurements to make, but it's also not unambiguous. You cannot just measure the carbon-13 and, and declare uh, uh, the biological nature. So things are very intertwined in, in the, our plans for the future. But we do hope to make that measurement again if we see high enough values. And we have no idea what lies ahead in terms of uh, the observation. So. Uh, uh, Jonathan Amos, BBC. What, what's the strategy for the wet cups? What, what's holding you back from using one of those? For the what? The, the wet, wet cups. Al, oh, Roger, you want to talk about that? Or? Oh, derivatizing. Yeah. I think from the, from the time the mission started, uh, the prime rule was uh, don't hurt curiosity. And uh, we haven't done enough analog experiments on, on the test bed yet 
to to understand completely how uh, the wet cups will behave. There has, has uh, uh, an experiment has been done using the MTBSTFA that's currently in the system as a result of leakage. And uh, the results of those experiments are very promising that, that, that expose the soil to the reagent produces a different pattern of peaks. But it's, it, it, it requires the SAM team to very, very carefully Evaluate how the cups uh, how the cups will work based on experiments done at Goddard on the actual test bed, and uh, I think also to find an appropriate sample, a sample that's that that we know has organic matter in it and one that's likely to yield a, a concrete result when the wet cup is used. So there are a, a number of intangibles at the moment, but the thinking about the experiment is 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 well advanced. We just haven't done it yet. Uh, Ken Chan, your times again. Um, going forward on, on methane, I was wondering, are there any collaborations with the India Mars or orbiter, and whether you know whether that orbiter could have seen this path of methane? No. Question for Jim. <laughs> yes. Jim, this one. Yeah, go ahead and answer it. Yeah, this is uh, Jim Green uh, from NASA headquarters once again. Uh, we've just started working with ISRO and their scientists to discuss um, exchanging data and exchanging um, uh, some of the scientific results between MOM and in particular MAVEN, but of course um, uh, their methane results will be extremely important, so uh, stay tuned to that. We we've started that process. Is there another question from the chat? Yes, this is a question from Lisa Grossman at New Scientist. Um, what do you think the origin of the chlorobenzene is, and could it have been crea created inside SAM? And are the origins are its origins ambiguous the way the methanes is? Go ahead, Roger. Uh, the question about whether it could have been uh, produced inside SAM uh, is something that we've looked at uh, very, very closely. Um, it could be produced inside SAM by a reaction of something in the soil with perchlorate in the soil. So that, that's one way it could be produced in SAM. Another way it could be produced in SAM is via the reaction between the products of perchlorate heating and the hydrocarbon trap that's part of the GCMS system. The hydrocarbon trap is a, an essential component of that system in that when, when the gases are released from heating the soil, they're concentrated in a very small space on the trap and then released onto the GC <coughs> column that gives you markedly improved ability to separate the compounds out. And when you separate them out well, then your mass spectrometry is much more convincing about the identification. So the trap is an essential component of the, of, the, of the experiment, but there's material in the hydrocarbon trap that contains aromatic uh, components that could possibly yield chlorobenzene. And so we've done many, many hundreds of experiments now at MIT and at Goddard testing the uh, robustness of the trap after repeated use. And we're very confident that that trap is not uh, degrading over time. You can produce tiny amounts of chlorobenzene from the trap, we've demonstrated that, but not, uh, we don't believe that you can produce the large amount that's found in Cumberland, and the trap would not explain the vast difference in concentrations of chlorobenzene between the Cumberland and the other um, uh, rocks that have been analysed. And uh, to make a plug for a poster tomorrow uh, by a postdoc, Kristen Miller, who's been working uh, as part of our participating scientist team, uh, that will be presented tomorrow morning. And it's a study showing or summarising all the experiments that we've done with the hydrocarbon trap that demonstrate quite clearly that it's robust and, and is very unlikely to be the source of the chlorobenzene. Roger, the other thing I would add is that, again, with reference to this figure, that the samples in John Klein and Confidence Hills were run the same way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we have time for one more question. Okay, we'll take it from the chat. Um, it's another question from Irene Klotz uh, for John. 
Will um, MSL be able to differentiate between biotic and abiotic organic compounds? Um, the short answer is, is no. Uh, there is some chance if there was a quantity of organics that was high enough that was discovered uh, that it could be through the chromatography that you could discover a structure that, that might, through uh, chirality, uh, suggest that, that biology is something worth pursuing. Um, but uh, I think really the, the right answer is let's get 2020 up there uh, uh, to follow this program of, of where the, the best rock materials are to return to Earth. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, all of you, for being here. And um, we'll have our next press conference at 11.30, and that's the uh, 2014 South Napa earthquake.